Welcome to another episode of Talks for a Magical Monday, the weekly podcast of the Heralds of the Gospel. I'm your host, Brother Gustavo. For those who are not familiar with the Heralds, the Heralds of the Gospel are a community active in the Catholic Archdiocese of Toronto, as well as several other cities across Canada. Founded by Monsignor Jean Cladias, the Heralds comprise priests, religious, brothers and sisters, and lay people since their pontifical recognition in 2001 by Pope John Paul II. And for those who are familiar with the Heralds, this podcast features the talks following the Heralds weekly rosary at St. Patrick's Parish in Schomburg, Ontario, where the brothers share some consoling and encouraging thoughts precisely geared to those dreaded beginnings of a probably hard week called Mondays. If you want to know more about the origin of the podcast, please stop right here. Go back and listen to episode number one. So even if today it's not Monday, but you're still commuting or doing chores, take heart brighten your perspectives and enjoy today's talk recorded at the Heralds of the Gospel House in Schomburg. The topic, the origin of the world's disasters, part two and conclusion, the fall of Adam and Eve. Welcome then to Talks for a Magical Monday, the weekly podcast of the Heralds of the Gospel. Well, welcome to another episode of Magical Mondays. So this is going to be our second part talking about the Great Fall. And from there, looking at um, the role of everything and the reason that we're in the soup, as could be said, of our everyday lives. So in our last episode, we talked about the Great Fall of the Angels and how that angelic fall was caused by envy, hate, for a God who loves, and Lucifer who thought he was so great. So, I ended with the very theme about what Lucifer wanted to do. It was better to rule in hell than to serve in heaven. And if there is is no service, there is no love. So, those concepts are very important. So we come to the creation, creation of the world, creation of of everything on the earth, and we have Adam and Eve. Adam in Aramaic meant the man. Uh, So not a very sophisticated name. Now, what's Adam's problem? Now, if we look at it, Adam has the aspect of a very immature individual. God would walk with him in the afternoons, teaching him, showing him. Adam already had, did not have a broken nature as we do. Adam had the ability of knowledge. He had um, the gifts, didn't get sick, didn't die, didn't age all these fantastic gifts. But Adam isn't happy. And God tries to find a companion for him. Someone who he can be with. Someone that will make him happy. And he makes out of his rib Eve. It's interesting to note that it's not out of uh, the foot of Adam nor out of the head of Adam that Eve is created, but out of his side. In the same idea, his companion was not meant to rule him, nor was he meant to subject, but they were to be fellow laborers in the vineyard of the Lord. You might say that's the role of a properly constituted couple in the sacrament of matrimony. If only 
matrimonies were so confected, there would be so much more happiness in our world. So, you see in the words of Adam that he's so happy with Eve that it's someone who is someone like himself. It's someone who is similar to himself. It's someone who is, you may say, different because she is female. He is male. They're different. You may say also that Adam was X amount of years or time or whatever term you want to use at that point, older, more experienced than Eve. Eve was meant to be his companion, but also he was meant to be the teacher of Eve. And there we find where things get really sloppy. Adam, at the beginning, never shows love, never shows true service. He complains. He's given a job, and hopefully it's a job which he likes, and you're suspecting that it's something that God has given him a job to do, that he already foresees that he will enjoy, which is to teach Eve, to show Eve how things are to be done. But what does Adam do? With the evidence presented, Eve is left by herself. Eve is abandoned. You may say it's the first um, instance of the male isolation syndrome, of slipping into his box and hiding from his issues and problems and responsibilities. And because the guardian isn't doing his job, the teacher is failing his student. The image of God is failing his responsibilities, is shirking his responsibilities. The serpent is in the garden. Now, God had given them one requirement and one requirement alone, which was not to eat from one tree. Now, how long would that requirement have been in place? We have no way of knowing. Was it a long-term need? We do not know. God gave them one rule. Do not eat from that tree. You have everything else. But not that. So what happens? Eve is left alone. Eve is abandoned. And she is guiled by the serpent. But where does the serpent go? Does he go and he promote straight up revolution? No. He doesn't. Does he present a logical plan on how he's going to return to heaven and overthrow God and install himself as king? That's a negative again. It's not true. He starts on the very same road that his own misery comes from. Suspicion, envy, and pride. But pride's the source of everything. And where does this come from? Where does this, where does this, how do we know this? The devil being the cleverest and using an animal that was known as the cleverest in the garden begins to enter into a relationship, enters into a a conversation, gives the attention which Adam had failed to give. Fed the self-love, the scorn that Eve most definitely felt. And begins to sow the seeds of suspicion of Eve with God. And since Eve didn't walk with God, but did know Adam, 
and Adam failing to do his responsibilities, then it already began to sour and poison this first marriage, this first relationship. Envy is terrible. Envy is gross. Envy is, envy is, is acid. And the serpent's words drip deep into the soul of Eve. Now, we don't know what would have happened if Adam would have been on top of the game. What stupidity was Adam up to? We have no idea. But we do know that at one point, the serpent is able to convince Eve, who knowingly takes this apple, eats of it, and then she goes and gives it to Adam. What words did she use? What guile did she use to convince Adam to eat of this? Because these two were not like us in a lot of ways. They didn't have concupiscence, the inclination to sin. Didn't have the weakness of character that we have, weakness of will. Their intelligence was beyond comparison. So Adam knew he was doing wrong by what he was doing. Eve knew she was doing wrong by what she was doing. They were disobeying God. God had given them one command. And in that one command, they couldn't follow through. Now, in the ancient Aramaic, the word obedience and listening are the same word. That's why you constantly see, listen, O Israel. That could be swapped out very easily for obey. How many times do we have in our lives hearing issues, deafness issues, the ears of the deaf are unstoppeded. How many of us are deaf with stopped ears, but not because of genetics, not because of an accident, but because of sinfulness? Our first parents made the mistake for lack of vigilance, of course, but by allowing the devil to poison their souls with the sin of envy. But if you look at the bottom of the envy, it's based on the concept that they were equal to God. But not just equal, they were greater than God. And there our issue lies in many of our own spiritual issues. Though hurtful it will be, when we go through our own via crucis, our own crosses of life, many a time, when disasters and sufferings come our way, we'll be tempted to say, but why me? Hopefully we have the strength to say, why not me? What did I do that was so good that deserved that I would not receive my own inheritance of my first parents? I receive good and I receive the consequences of sin both original, but more importantly, actual. Now, the difference between the two are very simple. Original sin is the result of this first sin of Adam and Eve in the garden. Their first rejection of God, for which they did over 900 years of penance. Actual sins are sins that I, you, we, all of us do commit, though conscious and voluntary, which would be mortal, or venial, which would be reflective acts or accidental things or things that we lack true freedom to relieve ourselves. We need to understand the first. And that's why Christ pointed to the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the legal experts and 
Israel as whole. Go back to the beginning. Understand the beginning. And in, in, in that understanding of the beginning, then we can liberate ourselves of the sins, faults, defects that we surround ourselves today. So, what was it that Satan's goal was, the long goal, in tempting Eve, spending his time, this superior intellectual being who despised humans, despised them so much that he revolted over the concept that the incarnation would happen with a human? The answer is, through his angelic intuition, he knew that if God incarnated himself into humanity, humanity would become his image, his iconus, his icon. An image, a material image of an eternal reality. So the devil tried to steal the very image of God, the very handiwork of God, to destroy it. So he could say, it's better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. The stupid part about it is that Lucifer forgot through his pride that he was, an, that he was merely a creature. Adam and Eve forgot that they were creatures, not gods. I will not serve resonates many a time very much like a toddler having a temper tantrum or a badly brought up child screaming at their parents in a supermarket saying, I hate you. What can a child at that age do against the adult figure? Nothing. The hurt that swells up in the mother's heart hearing those hurtful words. The anger which gyrates into the, into the very being of an adult who hears those words. A broken-hearted God looking at his creatures and seeing sin. And knowing that in and through his incarnation would be necessary not just to bring them as images but to save them from themselves and from their own sin. So let's not allow the concept of why does God do? Why does God do? Ask ourselves, why do I do? Do we remember our first sin? Do we remember our fifth sin that we committed? Do we remember our last sin that we committed? These are offenses against God's ma very majesty. And if we don't remember these things, if we do not change, if we do not reconcile with God, we are like that badly brought up child in the aisle in the supermarket screaming obscenities at their parents. And the parents looking at us with pity and sadness. So, what changes this scenario is found in 315 of Genesis that the prediction that God makes that will come from Adam and Eve will be a woman. St. Louis de Montfort makes it very clear, it's a woman that will come and be the heel for the incarnate God to crush the head of the infernal serpent who refuses to serve, who refuses to love, and therefore will be crushed. And to save us, the descendants of Adam and Eve, from their wickedness, from our own wickedness, and to bring us to what we need to be, to be true images of God in this world, but more than that, to be happy with Him in heaven for all eternity. 
So the angelic world that surrounds us, our guardian angels, the angels that govern and help us against temptation, who are very passive in a sense in our lives because they respect our free will. The angel that we were given at baptism, the angel that guards over us because of the sacrament of matrimony, or if we belong to a religious order, the angel that looks over a constituted parish, our country, our city, our diocese, our archdiocese, our very world. All of these angels who surround us at all moments, who await us to ask for help, ask for assistance, and who are more than willing to give us every sort of assistance conceivable. But keep in mind, although we have angels who are governors of all of those things and are waiting for the moment to assist us, there are unemployed governors. Those are the angels who had chosen Lucifer to not serve. So they are governors without governable property. And they are looking to infest and to take over, to steal, to rampage over anything that they can get their hands on. We need to be people of faith. We have to be Marthas and Marys working in this world, of course, but also admiring the glories of God. But let's pray to our guardian angels, all those angels who look over us every day to find a solution for us, to make us what we're called to be, true images of God. So today we're going to pray the guardian angel prayer that we all learned as children. And and Hail Mary in this month asking Our Lady's protection and guidance. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here, ever this day be at my side, to light, to guard, to rule, to guide. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mary, Queen of Angels, pray for us. Queen of all hearts, pray for us. Terror of demons, pray for us. And this is all for today's episode recorded live at the Heralds of the Gospel House in Schomburg, Ontario. You can reach us anytime at one of the Heralds websites, such as heralds.ca forward slash podcast, New Insights Multimedia forward slash podcast, or you can also subscribe on iTunes or anywhere you normally listen to your favorite podcast. And as per now, pray hard, work hard, keep growing in devotion to the Eucharist and our Blessed Mother, evangelize by word and example, and be every day more and more a real herald of the gospel. Is it